Good morning or afternoon. Welcome to Lab 6. We're going to be today studying the common source amplifier using the same MOSFET that you used last week, but this time we're going to complete the scene. So in lecture, I have already introduced this amplifier to you and I've given you all the formulas and I've explained to you the role of each component. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to build it and test it. So just a couple of things to set up before we go. You're going to be attaching channel one of your oscilloscope to this point right here. That is going to represent the input to the amplifier. If you put your input over here, you won't be measuring the true gain because the V into the amplifier is there. And then we're going to put channel two over there. So um, we're building this with a 15 volt DC supply. And then all the other resistor values here are labeled. The capacitors here are one microfarad. Their value is not terribly critical. As long as they're fairly large, it's okay. They will only affect the frequency response. And then later in the lab, we will be bypassing our sigma. So we will be installing a third capacitor over there to bypass our sigma to verify the gain with and without bypassing. So the first part of the lab we're going to do is set up the DCQ point. After you build your circuit, we notice we've left R2 here as a variable resistor. And we're going to adjust R2 until we get one milliamp of current going down through here. And the best way to, to verify that, we could either take an ammeter and insert it someplace in the path here, but that's kind of inconvenient. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to take a voltmeter, connect it to ground, and we're just going to measure the voltage here on the source. When we have one milliamp of current flowing, we will have a one volt drop across the 1K resistor. We're just going to tweak this pot here until this reads one volt. Once we have that, we're pretty much guaranteed that the current down through here is going to be one milliamp. When you do that, make a note of the VGS that you get here. So with your voltmeter, when you read one volt there, write down this voltage over here on the gate because we're going to need that VGS later um, to estimate our VT and our K and our G sub M. So once the circuit is built, you should be able to verify all of your DC voltages. This node here is going to be sitting at 15 minus 6.8 is 8.2 volts. You should be seeing about 8.2 volts DC over here. 0 volts DC there, 0 volts DC there, and here you're going to be seeing a voltage of around 2.5 or so, give or take. Once that's done, we can go ahead and start our measurements. So we're going to be measuring four things. The first thing we're going to be measuring is our gain. And we're going to be measuring gain twice, once with R sub sigma bypassed and once with R sigma unbypassed. So with C sub sigma and without C sub sigma. And the gain is just going to be this amplitude divided by this amplitude, peak to peak, RMS, ground to peak, as long as you're consistent here and here, you can use any standard you like to set the amplitude. Okay, so that's going to be the first thing we're going to be measuring is gain. The next thing we're going to be measuring is input impedance. And if you remember from class, input impedance is just going to be R1 parallel R2. Okay, R1 parallel R2. And the way we're going to measure input impedance looks like this. If we can model our amplifier having an input impedance of Rn going to ground, Okay, so this is our R in that's internal to the amplifier. It's internal to all these things. What I'd like to do is I'd like to temporarily take out this resistor and replace it with a potentiometer. So what we'll do is we'll set this resistor here to zero and get a clean measure value of V out. And then we're going to turn this resistor up until V out gets cut in half. So when V out gets cut in half, it means that half of this voltage goes across here and half of it goes across there. And then this pot will equal that resistance. We just take this and measure it and that's our Rn. 
So let's say that again. If our amplifier has a certain input resistance over here, and we insert another resistor of equal value there, we should see that this signal here gets cut in half. So Vs, half of it goes here, half of it goes there, and shows up on the output. And then this resistor will equal that resistor if this voltage here is half of what it used to be. So we're going to do that with a variable resistor here. We're going to set the resistor to zero, set our output voltage, let's say, four volts. And then we're going to gradually turn this resistor up until this goes down to two volts. When that happens, we'll take this resistor out, measure it with an ohmmeter, and record it as our RN. Okay. So needless to say, you are going to have to measure this potentiometer after you set it. When you get your one milliamp of current down here, take this pot out and measure it with an ohmmeter so you have an accurate rating for value of R2. So that's how we're going to measure R in, and I'll step you through the procedure as we go. Now to measure R out, we're going to use a similar technique. This is a voltage divider technique as well. Inside your amplifier, you have a voltage source. and a series resistance. And we're measuring the amplifier as having an ideal voltage source in series with the resistor. So what we're going to do to measure this is we're going to temporarily unplug RL and get a nice voltage out here. And then we're going to install a variable resistor over here and watch for that to cut this output in half. So again, we're going to unplug RL, set the V output for maybe six volts. Then we're going to plug in a variable resistor in the place of RL, and we're going to tweak that resistor until this gets cut in half. When that output voltage gets cut in half, it means that this resistor here equals that resistor there. We have a 50-50 voltage divider, and the value of this potentiometer is going to equal the value of R out. Remember the formula I gave you for R out is approximately equal to R sub D. Okay. And then the last thing we're going to measure is the dynamic range. The dynamic range is simply the largest voltage that we can make here. So that should we, we talked in class that the highest value this voltage can ever get is going to be up here, 15 volts. And the lowest this can ever get down there is going to be 1 volt. So we're expecting a dynamic range of 14 volts. And we're just going to take the input signal and crank it up until we see clipping top and bottom and measure the peak to peak amplitude of that clipped waveform and we'll see how that compares. So it should be equal to VDD minus VSQ. That's what we should be expecting for a dynamic range. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and build our amplifier and we're going to perform these measurements gain with and without C sigma. Input impedance, for input impedance, it doesn't matter whether C sigma is there or not. That is not the case for BJTs, but it is the case for MOSFETs. Output impedance, again, it won't matter whether C sigma is there or not. Dynamic range also. The C sigma really affects gain more than any other parameter. So that's what we're going to be doing uh, for our lab today. So at this point, we can uh, get started building the circuit, and we'll do some measurements on here. We are seated on our workbench. We have for equipment a Tektronix MSO 2012 oscilloscope number 635. We have a Keysight 33500B series signal generator number 793. And we have a Keithley model 2000 multimeter number 383. And we have an Agilent E3620A um, dual DC power supply number 688. The machines have all been turned on and given time to warm up, and now we can go ahead and start building. So uh, I'm going to start by building the transistor, and it goes DGS, drain gate source. So I'm just going to plug it in over here, there on three consecutive pins going horizontally. On the drain, we've got a 6.8K resistor that is blue, gray, red, and we're going to tie that. Oops, thank you. We're going to tie that from the drain terminal up to the VDD bus. I wired this VDD bus to be along the very top row. It's nice having brand new resistors. They fit into the holes so much more easily. And now we're going to do, go from there through a capacitor. To the output node coming over here. 
And then our 10K resistor is going to be our load going to ground. So we're going to run that resistor from that node down to the ground bus over here. So we have the output end of everything connected up. Now the source has a 1K resistor, brown, black, red, going to ground. So we'll do that one next. That's an easy one. The gate gets kind of cluttered, but the source is relatively easy to do. And then when we go to install the capacitor, the capacitor is probably not going to reach that far, although maybe it will, maybe it will. So I, I think it will be okay later on. We have to install the capacitor. And now the gate. The gate is going to have a 100K resistor, that's brown, black, yellow, going from gate to high. So let's plug that one in way at the top to keep it out of the way. And then we're going to finally have our potentiometer we're using just as a variable. So what I'll do is I'm going to plug in one of these leads, one end to the gate up here, and the other two, I'm just going to plug into ground. Normally, you only need to plug in the center, but when you plug them both in, it keeps them out of your way. So let's plug in the other two to ground, and we now have a variable resistor. And let's center the pot before we turn it on. So all the way one way, all the way the other way, then back in the middle, okay? And then we just need to connect up our input. So the input is also going to go where the gate terminal is through a capacitor from there to there. And then we have finally our RS, that's our source resistor. And that is going to go from there, from the capacitor, just off to some far off point over here. Okay. And then all that's left up is to connect up our equipment. So I can move this out of the way. Oh, thank you. And we need to connect up our power supply. I'm going to make sure that the we're going to set the voltage for 15 volts on channel one on output number one. Okay. And so that will be connected um, from plus to plus and from ground. And I'm going to just shut the power off temporarily while I put this up and, and I'm going to do give the circuit one more looking over before I apply power. And then we need to connect up our signal generator. So we have a coaxial cable right here. And that plugs into the output of our signal generator. Be careful not to use the sync output. You won't need that until some other time. And I'm going to connect the ground lead over here to keep it away from our board to keep our board a little bit neater. And then this is going to connect to our S, our source resistor over there. And then finally, all that's left is our probes. So we're going to put channel one over here, connected to the junction between RS and the CS right there. And ground, we'll just clip this onto a handy point right here, which is nice and out of the way. And then channel two, we're going to connect to, they're so nicely tied up, I hate to untie them. Channel two connecting to the output, which is on this side, the 10K resistor. And then finally, we're going to be using this meter here as our voltmeter for just doing a couple of measurements. And so for that, we're going to ground the negative side. And I'm going to ground it again to the equipment, not to the board, just to keep the wiring a little neater. And then the positive side, we're going to use a probe. So the positive input for voltages is up here on top and we're going to be using this probe to be measuring DC voltages. So we should be ready to go. So what we're going to do first, we're going to first double check our circuit, make sure that, it, that there's nothing wrong with the way it's constructed. And then we're going to turn the power on and set the DC operating point. So to do that, we have our volts here. We're going to be set on DC volts, which we are. And we're going to look for one volt across RS. One volt is 
going to be appearing right there. So let's turn the power back on and look for smoke. Cross your fingers. Okay, and we got pretty lucky with the potentiometer. We're at about 1.18 volts. So we just have to tweak this down a little bit. Oops, wrong way. Okay, so right now we're sitting at one volt on the source. The DC bias is correctly set. Let's see what kind of a DC bias we have on the drain. We had predicted 15 minus 6.8 is 8.2. Let's see if we have 8.2 on the drain. 8.17, that's pretty good. So it looks like the transistor is properly biased now. It's passing the current that we want. So if we know the IDSQ, we'll be able to easily, more easily calculate the K and the G sub M, which we'll need later in the lab. Okay, so at this point, let's take the potentiometer out and measure it. So I'm going to unplug from this side temporarily and switch this to ohms and just measure the resistance. And what we get is about 27.1 kilo ohms. So that's the value for R2. R2 is 27.1 kilo ohms, right smack in the middle of the range. This is a 50K pot, which means it goes from, um, from zero to 50K, and we want to have something that's in the middle of its range. Plug it back in. Let us do just double check one more time that our circuit is still alive. One volt, and we are good to go. So now we can go ahead and start to measure our AC parameters. We're going to start with gain. So let us turn on the output here. We're setting our signal generator for a sine wave. And we'd like to have parameters. Frequency, one kilohertz is good. Amplitude is 100 millivolts peak to peak. I think we can do a little better than that. Let's set this for one volt peak to peak. And we'll see how that shows up. And what we should be seeing is a waveform on the scope. So I'm going to hit the auto set and see if that shows up on the scope. And it doesn't. Okay, so let's find out why that is. We have the signal, we have channel one coming to there. Let's just see if it's showing up on here. No, it is not. Okay, let's see if the scope is even working. Let's plug this into the handy dandy calibrator that comes on the scope. And that looks like it's working. So it looks to me like the problem is that I forgot to turn on the waveform. So there should be a waveform button. Uh, channel. Channel, that one. Okay, so we do have a square wave here. You can see that the square wave there. A good thing to do to just check your scope is you've got a built-in signal source right there. Just go ahead and check that, and that is working. So let's go back to here and see if we have a sine wave. And with this time, we're going to turn on the output, the channel button. Oh, output on. And cross your fingers, and it looks like we do have a sine wave. So channel one is there. And let's see if we can get it to hold still. It's jumping around a lot because the waveform is small, so I'm going to set the trigger to source on channel 2. Source. Channel 2. Channel 2 is a much bigger wave, and it's much easier for the scope to trigger on it. Okay. Now, it looks like it's working. However, it's disturbing that the waveforms are not quite 180 degrees out of sync. So, and that I think is because our capacitors are so small. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to crank up the frequency a little bit. Parameter, frequency, because we really, to get this thing working, the waveforms really have to be 180 degrees out of phase. They're still in phase. I wonder if it's a triggering thing with the scope, because they should be out of phase with each other. Um, let's just try, let's just see if, first of all, let me reconnect the ground and see if that makes a difference. Nope, they're still in phase. These waveforms have to be out of phase for us to continue with this. 
and they're in phase there. So why is it that the waveform is coming out? Um, amplitude, let's, let's make it a little bit bigger still. Okay, why would the waveforms be in phase with each other when they have to be out of phase? Uh, oh, because, no, we're looking at the, the input. Let's see. I don't know if this is a scope anomaly. I don't think it is. The waveforms have to be out of phase. So there's a 10K to ground. Um, oh, I see why. The capacitor is going to the source and not the gate. Okay. So I had the capacitor going to the source and not the gate. Now the capacitor is going to the gate and the waveforms are pretty and they're perfectly out of phase, which is exactly where they should be. Typical thing to go wrong building a circuit. Okay, so um, let us go ahead and measure the gain. It looks like the gain right now is, let's set up the measurement menu on this so we can just read them off the screen. It looks like they're already there. Channel one, the input is 2.52. Channel two, the output is 7.84. Oh, hang on. We should be measuring the input over here. Input is 2.40, 2.44. Output is 7.84. So that is our gain unbypassed. That is our gain unbypassed. That is without C sub sigma. And then to measure the gain bypassed, we're just going to recruit this third capacitor and just pop it across the resistor and see what it gives us. So if I just, I can just touch it on there temporarily. And what we see is the output got way, way bigger. In fact, it got so big that it's clipping now. So now to fix that, we're going to have to reduce our amplitude until we get a clean waveform. Okay. And measure our gain again. Now you'll notice this time that the input is kind of noisy. And so I'm going to turn on the averaging feature, which will take the noise away. So we're going to put the averaging on and you'll see that the waveform now gets much cleaner and it'll be a more reliable reading. So now we have an input of 0.2 volts and we have an output of 4.7 volts. So we're now looking at a gain of about 24 before we had a gain of about three. So you can see that bypassing has a huge influence on gain. So again, the input is 0 0.2 volts, 199 millivolts. The output is 4.7 volts. And that's a very large gain. That's a gain of about 24. Okay. So we have now completed our gain measurements. Okay. We can turn the averaging off now because it does make the way the scope sluggish in responding. And we can cr crank our input amplitude back up. Okay. And we're now ready to do our measurements of input impedance. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to need a second pot, by the way. Sorry. If you have another 50K, that's fine. All right. What a guy. All right. So now what we're going to do to measure our input impedance is we're going to set our output voltage to something that's really easy like 6.72, let's set it for six. Uh, let's do a little bit finer setting on that. We wanna set our output to 6.00. There we go. So what we'll do now is we're going to insert this potentiometer in the path and look for the output to drop to three. Then we'll take the potentiometer out and measure it. Okay, so we're going to temporarily break the path through the input and insert this potentiometer in the way. So the potentiometer now has been interrupted and it's placed in series with RS. Okay, and let's, let's uh, zero the pot 
and verify that we're still at six volts and we are. So when the pot is at zero, let's turn that down just a little, there we go, zero. The pot is now at zero and we have the full blast output and now we're gonna pull, turn the pot up until the output drops to three. Let's crank up the signal a little bit. Okay, there's three volts. Okay, so at that point, now the resistance of the pot is equal to the resistance going into the amplifier. So now we can take the potentiometer out and measure its value and see what we get. What we're hoping to get is R1 parallel R2, which is going to be about 20K, give or take. So we have our probe on one end and our lead here on the other end. Set this on ohms and see what we get. We get about 26.3 kilo ohms. So the input impedance to our circuit is about 26.3 kilo ohms, 26.2 kilo ohms. Let me make sure that 26.4. Okay, so our input impedance is 26.4. We can compare that with our calculation of R1 parallel R2 and see how close we are. That is our input impedance measurement. The output impedance measurement, we're going to do the same thing, but this time we're going to put the pot in the place of our load resistor. So the load resistor is over here. We're going to temporarily unplug the 10K because the 10K is not part of the amplifier, it's the load. So, and now we're going to, this time we're going to center the pot before we plug it in because we don't want it to short out the output. And we're gonna connect it from the other end of the output capacitor down to ground. And as you recall, last time we had six volts coming out. Actually, let's double check that. Let's, we're gonna look for this voltage to get cut in half. So right now we're talking about 10 volts peak to peak. Let's dial that down to 10. Okay, so we are now making 10 volts on the output. And the input I disconnected, which we don't have to worry about that. Okay. And so now what I'll do is I'm going to plug in the pot and we're going to turn the pot until this reads now five volts. So we're going to reconnect the pot and tweak the pot until the output reads five. So there's eight, seven, six, oops. There's five volts right there. Okay, so now what that means is that the resistance of the pot is equal to the resistance of the amplifier because it cut the signal in half. So now we take the pot out and measure it. And what we're hoping to see is something around 6.8K. Let's see what we get. On the ohm meter, 6.03K. 6.03K, and so that little bit of error is probably because we did not include little RO, but we are not in a position to calculate little RO just yet. So that is the output impedance of this amplifier. Let's go ahead and put our 10K back in place. And we have one final measurement to do, that's dynamic range, and that's a very easy one. What we're gonna do is just crank up the input until the output starts clipping top and bottom. And there it is. So we're hoping to get a dynamic range of about 14 volts, but what we're seeing is around 10.2. And so, and that's because the source is actually coming up and down and uh, we're, we're hitting the source when it comes up. So we're getting a dynamic range of about 10.2 volts, right? And then one additional measurement we can take is what's the largest waveform we can get that's undistorted. So you can see that right now the top is still clipped a little bit more the bottom. So right about there, the waveform is undistorted relatively. And it looks like this has a symmetrical dynamic range of 9.4. So that's the biggest wave that this amplifier can make is 9.4 volts before it starts to distort either end, top or bottom. And that is it.